Chapter 3, Temperature Temperature is one of the basic elements of weather and climate. When someone asks what the weather is like outside, air temperature is often the first element we mention. From everyday experience, we know that temperatures vary on different time scales, seasonally, daily, and even hourly. Moreover, we all realize that substantial temperature differences exist from one place to another. In Chapter 2 you learned how air is heated and examined the role of Earth-Sun relationships in causing temperature variations from season to season and from latitude to latitude. In this chapter you will focus on several other aspects of this very important atmospheric property, including factors other than Earth-Sun relationships, that act as temperature controls. You will also look at how temperature is measured and expressed and see that temperature data can be of very practical value to us all. Applications include calculations that are useful in evaluating energy consumption, crop maturity, and human comfort. Focus on concepts After completing this chapter you should be able to calculate five commonly used types of temperature data and interpret a map that depicts temperature data using isotherms. List the principal controls of temperature and use examples to describe their effects. Explain why water and land heat and cool differently. Interpret the patterns depicted on world maps of January and July temperatures and on a world map of annual temperature ranges. Discuss the basic daily and annual cycles of air temperature. Explain how different types of thermometers work and why the placement of thermometers is an important factor in obtaining accurate readings. Distinguish among Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin temperature scales. Discuss the concept of apparent temperature and compare two basic indices that are expressions of this idea. For the record, air temperature data. Temperatures recorded daily at thousands of weather stations worldwide provide much of the temperature data compiled by meteorologists and climatologists, figure 3-1. Hourly temperatures may be recorded by an observer or obtained from automated observing systems that continually monitor the atmosphere. At many locations only the maximum and minimum temperatures are obtained c, box 3-1. Basic Calculations The daily mean temperature is determined by averaging the 24 hourly readings or by adding the maximum and minimum temperatures for a 24 hour period and dividing by 2. From the maximum and minimum, the daily temperature range is computed by finding the difference between these figures. Other data involving longer periods are also compiled. The monthly mean temperature is calculated by adding together the daily means for each day of the month and dividing by the number of days in the month. The annual mean temperature is an average of the 12 monthly means. The annual temperature range is computed by finding the difference between the warmest and coldest monthly mean temperatures. Mean temperatures are especially useful for making daily, monthly, and annual comparisons. It is common to hear a weather reporter state, last month was the warmest February on record or today Omaha was 10 degrees warmer than Chicago. Temperature ranges are also useful statistics because they give an indication of extremes, a necessary part of understanding the weather and climate of a place or an area. Isotherms To examine the distribution of air temperatures over large areas, Isotherms are commonly used. An isotherm is a line that connects points on a map that have the same temperature. Therefore, all points through which an isotherm passes have identical temperatures for the time period indicated. Generally, isotherms representing 5 degrees or 10 degrees temperature differences are used, but any interval may be chosen. 
Figure 3 2 illustrates how isotherms are drawn on a map. Notice that most isotherms do not pass directly through the observing stations because the station readings may not coincide with the values chosen for the isotherms. Only an occasional station temperature will be exactly the same as the value of the isotherm, so it is usually necessary to draw the lines by estimating the proper position between stations. Isothermal maps are valuable tools because they clearly make temperature distribution visible at a glance. Areas of low and high temperatures are easy to pick out. In addition, the amount of temperature change per unit of distance, called the temperature gradient, is easy to visualize. Closely spaced isotherms indicate a rapid rate of temperature change whereas more widely spaced lines indicate a more gradual rate of change. For example, notice in Figure 3-2 that the isotherms are more closely spaced in Colorado and Utah, steeper temperature gradient, whereas the isotherms are spread farther apart in Texas, gentler temperature gradient. Without isotherms a map would be covered with numbers representing temperatures at tens or hundreds of places, which would make patterns difficult to see. Students sometimes ask, What's the hottest city in the United States? It depends on how you define hottest. If average annual temperature is used, then Key West, Florida, is the hottest, with an annual mean of 25.6 degrees Celsius, 78 degrees Fahrenheit, for the 30-year span 1971-2000. However, if we look at cities with the highest July maximums during the 1971-2000 span, then the desert community of Palm Springs, California, has the distinction of being hottest. Its average daily high in July is a blistering 42.4 degrees Celsius. Yuma, Arizona 41.7 degrees Celsius, Phoenix, Arizona 41.4 degrees Celsius, and Las Vegas, Nevada 40 degrees Celsius, aren't far behind. Why temperatures vary, the controls of temperature. The controls of temperature are factors that cause temperatures to vary from place to place and from time to time. Chapter 2 examined the most important cause for temperature variation differences in the receipt of solar radiation. Because variations in sun angle and length of daylight depend on latitude, they are responsible for warm temperatures in the tropics and colder temperatures poleward. Of course, seasonal temperature changes at a given latitude occur as the sun's vertical rays migrate toward and away from a place during the year. Figure 3-3 reminds us of the importance of latitude as a control of temperature. But latitude is not the only control of temperature. If it were, we would expect all places along the same parallel to have identical temperatures. This is clearly not the case. For instance, Eureka, California, and New York City are both coastal cities at about the same latitude and both places have an annual mean temperature of 11 degrees Celsius, 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet New York City is 9.4 degrees Celsius, 16.9 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than Eureka in July and 9.4 degrees Celsius, 16.9 degrees Fahrenheit, colder than Eureka in January. In another example, Two cities in Ecuador Quito and Guayaquil are relatively close to one another, but the mean annual temperatures at these two cities differ by 12.2 degrees Celsius, 22 degrees Fahrenheit. To explain these situations and countless others, we must realize that factors other than latitude also exert a strong influence on temperature. In the next sections we examine these other controls, which include Differential heating of land and water Ocean currents Altitude
Geographic Position Cloud Cover and Albedo Land and Water In Chapter 2 you saw that the heating of Earth's surface controls the heating of the air above it. Therefore, to understand variations in air temperature, we must understand the variations in heating properties of the different surfaces that Earth presents to the sun's soil, water, trees, ice, and so on. Different land surfaces reflect and absorb varying amounts of incoming solar energy, which in turn cause variations in the temperature of the air above. The greatest contrast, however, is not between different land surfaces but between land and water. Figure 3-4 illustrates this idea nicely. This satellite image shows surface temperatures in portions of Nevada, California, and the adjacent Pacific Ocean on the afternoon of May 2, 2004, during a spring heat wave. Land surface temperatures are clearly much higher than water surface temperatures. The image shows the extreme high surface temperatures in Southern California and Nevada in dark red. Surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean are much lower. The peaks of the Sierra Nevada, still capped with snow, form a cool blue line down the eastern side of California. In side-by-side -side bodies of land and water, such as is shown in Figure 3-4, land heats more rapidly and to higher temperatures than water, and it cools more rapidly and to lower temperatures than water. Variations in air temperatures, therefore, are much greater over land than over water. Why do land and water heat and cool differently? Several factors are responsible. 1. An important reason that the surface temperature of water rises and falls much more slowly than the surface temperature of land is that water is highly mobile. As water is heated, Convection distributes the heat through a considerably larger mass. Daily temperature changes occur to depths of 6 meters, 20 feet, or more below the surface, and yearly, oceans and deep lakes experience temperature variations through a layer between 200 and 600 meters, 650 and 2,000 feet, thick. In contrast, Heat does not penetrate deeply into soil or rock, it remains near the surface. Obviously, no mixing can occur on land because it is not fluid. Instead, heat must be transferred by the slow process of conduction. Consequently, daily temperature changes are small below a depth of 10 cm, 4 inches although some change can occur to a depth of perhaps 1 meter, 3 feet. Annual temperature variations usually reach depths of 15 meters, 50 feet, or less. Thus, as a result of the mobility of water and the lack of mobility in the solid earth, a relatively thick layer of water is heated to moderate temperatures during the summer. On land only a thin layer is heated but to much higher temperatures. During winter the shallow layer of rock and soil that was heated in summer cools rapidly. Water bodies, in contrast, cool slowly as they draw on the reserve of heat stored within. As the water surface cools, vertical motions are established. The chilled surface water, which is dense, sinks and is replaced by warmer water from below, which is less dense. Consequently, a larger mass of water must cool before the temperature at the surface will drop appreciably. 2. Because land surfaces are opaque, heat is absorbed only at the surface. This fact is easily demonstrated at a beach on a hot summer afternoon by comparing the surface temperature of the sand to the temperature just a few centimeters beneath the surface. Water, being more transparent, 
allows some solar radiation to penetrate to a depth of several meters. 3. The specific heat, the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of 1 gram of a substance 1 degree Celsius, is more than three times greater for water than for land. Thus, water requires considerably more heat to raise its temperature the same amount as an equal volume of land. 4. Evaporation, a cooling process, from water bodies is greater than from land surfaces. Energy is required to evaporate water. When energy is used for evaporation, it is not available for heating. All these factors collectively cause water to warm more slowly, store greater quantities of heat, and cool more slowly than land. Monthly temperature data for two cities will demonstrate the moderating influence of a large water body and the extremes associated with land, figure 3-5. Vancouver, British Columbia, is located along the windward Pacific coast, whereas Winnipeg, Manitoba, is in a continental position far from the influence of water. Both cities are at about the same latitude and thus experience similar sun angles and lengths of daylight. Winnipeg, however, has a mean January temperature that is 20 degrees Celsius, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, lower than Vancouver's. Conversely, Winnipeg's July mean is 2.6 degrees Celsius, 4.7 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than Vancouver's. Although their latitudes are nearly the same, Winnipeg, which has no water influence, experiences much greater temperature extremes than does Vancouver. The key to Vancouver's moderate year-round climate is the Pacific Ocean. On a different scale, the moderating influence of water may also be demonstrated when temperature variations in the northern and southern hemispheres are compared. The views of Earth in Figure 3-6 show the uneven distribution of land and water over the globe. Water covers 61% of the northern hemisphere, land represents the remaining 39%. However, the figures for the southern hemisphere, 81% water and 19% land, reveal why it is correctly called the water hemisphere. Between 45 degrees north and 79 degrees north latitude there is actually more land than water, whereas between 40 degrees south and 65 degrees south latitude there is almost no land to interrupt the oceanic and atmospheric circulation. Figure 3-7 portrays the considerably smaller annual temperature ranges in the water-dominated southern hemisphere compared with the northern hemisphere. Box 3-1 North America's Hottest and Coldest Places Most people living in the United States have experienced temperatures of 38 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or more. When statistics for the 50 states are examined for the past century or longer, we find that every state has a maximum temperature record of 38 degrees Celsius or higher. Even Alaska has recorded a temperature this high. Its record was set June 27, 1915, at Fort Yukon, a town along the Arctic Circle in the interior of the state. Maximum Temperature Records Surprisingly, the state that ties Alaska for the lowest high is Hawaii. Panala, on the south coast of the Big Island, recorded 38 degrees Celsius on April 27, 1931. Although humid tropical and subtropical places such as Hawaii are known for being warm throughout the year, they seldom experience maximum temperatures that surpass the low to mid 30 S Celsius. 90s Fahrenheit. The highest accepted temperature record for the United States as well as the entire Western Hemisphere is 57 degrees Celsius, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. This long standing record was set at Death Valley, California, on July 10, 
1913. Summer temperatures at Death Valley are consistently among the highest in the Western Hemisphere. During June, July, and August, temperatures exceeding 49 degrees Celsius, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, are to be expected. Fortunately, Death Valley has few human summertime residents. Why are summer temperatures at Death Valley so high? In addition to having the lowest elevation in the Western Hemisphere, 53 meters, 174 feet, below sea level, Death Valley is a desert. Although it is only about 300 kilometers, less than 200 miles, from the Pacific Ocean, mountains cut off the valley from the ocean's moderating influence and moisture. Clear skies allow a maximum of sunshine to strike the dry, barren surface. Because no energy is used to evaporate moisture as occurs in humid regions, all the energy is available to heat the ground. In addition, subsiding air that warms by compression as it descends is also common to the region and contributes to its high maximum temperatures. Minimum Temperature Records The temperature controls that produce truly frigid temperatures are predictable, and they should come as no surprise. We should expect extremely cold temperatures during winter in high-latitude places that lack the moderating influence of the ocean, Figure 3a. Moreover, Stations located on ice sheets and glaciers should be especially cold, as should stations positioned high in the mountains. All of these criteria apply to Greenland's North High Station, elevation 2,307 meters, 7,567 feet. Here on January 9, 1954, the temperature plunged to minus 66 degrees Celsius. Minus 87 degrees Fahrenheit. If we exclude Greenland from consideration, Snag, in Canada's Yukon Territory, holds the record for North America. This remote outpost experienced a temperature of minus 63 degrees Celsius, minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit, on February 3, 1947. When only locations in the United States are considered, Prospect Creek, located north of the Arctic Circle in the Endicott Mountains of Alaska, came close to the North American record on January 23, 1971, when the temperature plunged to minus 62 degrees Celsius, minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. In the lower 48 states the record of minus 57 degrees Celsius, minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, was set in the mountains at Rogers Pass, Montana, on January 20, 1954. Remember that many other places have no doubt experienced equally low or even lower temperatures, they just were not recorded. Ocean Currents You probably have heard of the Gulf Stream an important surface current in the Atlantic Ocean that flows northward along the east coast of the United States, Figure 3.8. Surface currents like this one are set in motion by the wind. At the water surface, where the atmosphere and ocean meet, energy is passed from moving air to the water through friction. As a consequence, the drag exerted by winds blowing steadily across the ocean causes the surface layer of water to move. Thus, major horizontal movements of surface waters are closely related to the circulation of the atmosphere, which in turn is driven by the unequal heating of Earth by the Sun, Figure 3-9. Surface ocean currents have an important effect on climate. It is known that for Earth as a whole, the gains in solar energy equal the losses to space of heat radiated from the surface. When most latitudes are considered individually, however, this is not the case. There is a net gain of energy in lower latitudes, 
and there is a net loss at higher latitudes. Because the tropics are not becoming progressively warmer, nor are the polar regions becoming colder, there must be a large-scale transfer of heat from areas of excess to areas of deficit. This is indeed the case. The transfer of heat by winds and ocean currents equalizes these latitudinal energy imbalances. Ocean water movements account for about one quarter of this total heat transport, and winds account for the remaining three quarters. The moderating effect of poleward moving warm ocean currents is well known. The North Atlantic Drift, an extension of the warm Gulf Stream, keeps wintertime temperatures in Great Britain and much of Western Europe warmer than would be expected for their latitudes, London is farther north than St. John's, Newfoundland. Because of the prevailing westerly winds, the moderating effects are carried far inland. For example, Berlin, 52 degrees north latitude, has a mean January temperature similar to that experienced in New York City, which lies 12 degrees latitude farther south. The January mean in London, 51 degrees north latitude, is 4.5 degrees Celsius, 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than in New York City. In contrast to warm ocean currents such as the Gulf Stream, the effects of which are felt most during the winter, cold currents exert their greatest influence in the tropics or during the summer months in the middle latitudes. For example, the cool Benguela current off the western coast of southern Africa moderates the tropical heat along this coast. Walvis Bay, 23 degrees south latitude a town adjacent to the Benguela current, is 5 degrees Celsius, 9 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler in summer than Durban, which is 6 degrees latitude farther poleward but on the eastern side of South Africa, away from the influence of the current, figure 39. The east and west coasts of South America provide another example. Figure 310 shows monthly mean temperatures for Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, which is influenced by the warm Brazil current and Arica, Chile, which is adjacent to the cold Peru current. Closer to home, because of the cold California current, summer temperatures in subtropical coastal Southern California are lower by 6 degrees Celsius, 10.8 degrees Fahrenheit, or more compared to East Coast stations. Altitude Recall from Chapter 1 that temperatures decrease with an increase in altitude in the troposphere. As a result, some mountain tops are snow covered year round. This can even occur in the tropics if the mountains are high enough. Figure 311 The two cities in Ecuador mentioned earlier, Quito and Guayaquil demonstrate the influence of altitude on mean temperature. Both cities are near the equator and relatively close to one another, 
but the annual mean temperature at Guayaquil is 25.5 degrees Celsius, 77.9 degrees Fahrenheit, compared with Quito's mean of 13.3 degrees Celsius, 55.9 degrees Fahrenheit. The difference may be understood when the city's elevations are noted. Guayaquil is only 12 meters, 39 feet, above sea level, whereas Quito is high in the Andes Mountains at 2,800 meters, 9,200 feet. Figure 312 provides another example. In Chapter 1 you learned that temperatures drop an average of 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer, 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet, in the troposphere. However, if this figure is applied, we would expect Quito to be about 18.2 degrees Celsius, 32.7 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than Guayaquil, but the difference is only 12.2 degrees Celsius. 22 degrees Fahrenheit. The fact that high altitude places, such as Quito, are warmer than the value calculated using the normal lapse rate results from the absorption and re-radiation of solar energy by the ground surface. In addition to the effect of altitude on mean temperatures, the daily temperature range also changes with variations in height. Not only do temperatures drop with an increase in altitude but atmospheric pressure and density also diminish. Because of the reduced density at high altitudes, the overlying atmosphere absorbs and reflects a smaller portion of the incoming solar radiation. Consequently, with an increase in altitude, the intensity of solar radiation increases, resulting in relatively rapid and intense daytime heating. Conversely, rapid nighttime cooling is also the rule in high mountain locations. Therefore, stations located high in the mountains generally have a greater daily temperature range than do stations at lower elevations. Geographic Position The geographic setting can greatly influence the temperatures experienced at a specific location. A coastal location where prevailing winds blow from the ocean onto the shore, a windward coast, experiences considerably different temperatures than does a coastal location where prevailing winds blow from the land toward the ocean, a leeward coast. In the first situation the windward coast will experience the full moderating influence of the ocean cool summers and mild winters compared to an inland station at the same latitude. A leeward coastal situation, however, will have a more continental temperature regime because the winds do not carry the ocean's influence on shore. Eureka, California, and New York City, the two cities mentioned earlier, illustrate this aspect of geographic position, figure 313. The annual temperature range in New York City is 19 degrees Celsius, 34 degrees Fahrenheit greater than Eureka's. Seattle and Spokane, both in the state of Washington, illustrate a second aspect of geographic position, mountains acting as barriers. Although Spokane is only about 360 kilometers, 225 miles, east of Seattle, the towering Cascade Range separates the cities. Consequently, Seattle's temperatures show a marked marine influence, but Spokane's are more typically continental, figure 314. Spokane is 7 degrees Celsius, 12.6 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than Seattle in January and 4 degrees Celsius, 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than Seattle in July. The annual range at Spokane is 11 degrees Celsius nearly 20 degrees Fahrenheit, greater than in Seattle. The Cascade Range effectively cuts off Spokane from the moderating influence of the Pacific Ocean. Cloud Cover and Albedo
You may have noticed that clear days are often warmer than cloudy ones and that clear nights usually are cooler than cloudy ones. This demonstrates that cloud cover is another factor that influences temperature in the lower atmosphere. Studies using satellite images show that at any particular time, about half of our planet is covered by clouds. Cloud cover is important because many clouds have a high albedo and therefore reflect a significant proportion of the sunlight that strikes them back to space. By reducing the amount of incoming solar radiation, daytime temperatures will be lower than if the clouds were absent and the sky were clear. Figure 315. As was noted in Chapter 2, the albedo of clouds depends on the thickness of the cloud cover and can vary from 25 to 80 percent, see Figure 217, page 51. At night, clouds have the opposite effect as during daylight. They absorb outgoing Earth radiation and emit a portion of it toward the surface. Consequently, some of the heat that otherwise would have been lost remains near the ground. Thus, nighttime air temperatures do not drop as low as they would on a clear night. The effect of cloud cover is to reduce the daily temperature range by lowering the daytime maximum and raising the nighttime minimum. This is illustrated nicely by the graph in Figure 315. The effect of cloud cover on reducing maximum temperatures can also be detected when monthly mean temperatures are examined for some stations. For example, each year much of southern Asia experiences an extended period of relative drought during the cooler low sun period, it is then followed by heavy monsoon rains. The graph for Yangon, Myanmar, also known as Rangoon, Burma, illustrates this pattern, figure 316. Notice that the highest monthly mean temperatures occur in April and May, before the summer solstice, rather than in July and August, as normally occurs at most stations in the Northern Hemisphere. Why? The reason is that during the summer months, when we would usually expect temperatures to climb, the extensive cloud cover increases the albedo of the region, which reduces incoming solar radiation at the surface. As a result, the highest monthly mean temperatures occur in late spring, when the skies are still relatively clear. Cloudiness is not the only phenomenon that increases albedo and thereby reduces air temperature. We also recognize that snow and ice-covered surfaces have high albedos, figure 317. This is one reason mountain glaciers do not melt away in the summer and why snow may still be present on a mild spring day. In addition, during the winter when snow covers the ground, daytime maximums on a sunny day are cooler than they otherwise would be because energy that the land would have absorbed and used to heat the air is reflected and lost. Severe and Hazardous Weather Heat Waves A heat wave is a prolonged period of abnormally hot and usually humid weather that typically lasts from a few days to several weeks. The impact of heat waves on individuals varies greatly. The elderly are the most vulnerable because heat puts more stress on weak hearts and bodies. The poor, who often cannot afford air conditioning, also suffer disproportionately. Studies also show that the temperature at which death rates increase varies from city to city. In Dallas, Texas, a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius, 103 degrees Fahrenheit, is required before the death rate climbs. In San Francisco the key temperature is just 29 degrees Celsius, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. The 1936 North American heat wave is likely the continent's most severe in modern history. Heat waves do not elicit the same sense of fear or urgency as tornadoes, hurricanes, and flash floods. 
One reason is that it may take many days of oppressive temperatures for a heat wave to exact its toll rather than just a few minutes or a few hours. Another reason is that they cause far less property damage than other extreme weather events. Nevertheless, heat waves can be deadly and costly. The 1936 North American heat wave is likely the continent's most severe in modern history. It took place during the economic hard times of the Great Depression and coincided with a significant drought in many parts of the Great Plains and Midwest. The prolonged heat wave began in late June and did not end until early September. The estimated death toll exceeded 5,000, and agricultural losses were catastrophic in many areas. Many records from this summer of exceptional temperatures still stand. In fact, current record high temperatures for 13 states are from July and August 1936, Table 3A. There are other extraordinary records as well. There are other extraordinary records as well. For example, Mount Vernon, Illinois, experienced 18 straight days, August 12th to 29th, when temperatures surpassed 38 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. A recent example occurred in the summer of 2003, when much of Europe experienced perhaps its worst heat wave in more than a century. The image in Figure 3B relates to this deadly event. An estimate based on government records puts the death toll at between 20,000 and 35,000. The majority died during the first two weeks of August, the hottest span. France suffered the greatest number of heat-related fatalities, about 14,000. The severity of heat waves is usually greatest in cities. The dangerous impact of summer heat is also reinforced when examining Figure 3C, which shows average annual weather-related deaths in the United States for the 10-year period 2001-2010. A comparison of values reveals that the number of heat deaths is among the highest. The severity of heat waves is usually greatest in cities because of the urban heat island, see Box 33. Large cities do not cool off as much at night during heat waves as rural areas do, and this can be a critical difference in the amount of heat stress within the inner city. In addition, the stagnant atmospheric conditions usually associated with heat waves trap pollutants in urban areas and add the stresses of severe air pollution to the already dangerous stresses caused by the high temperatures. In July 1995, a brief but intense heat wave developed in the central United States. A total of 830 deaths were attributed to this severe five-day event, the worst in 50 years in the northern Midwest. The greatest loss of life occurred in Chicago, where there were 525 fatalities. This event provided a sobering lesson by focusing attention on the need for more effective warning and response plans, especially in major urban areas where heat stress is greatest. World Distribution of Temperatures Take a moment to study the two world isothermal maps in, figures 318 and 319. From hot colors near the equator to cool colors toward the poles, these maps portray sea level temperatures in the seasonally extreme months of January and July. On these maps you can study global temperature patterns and the effects of the controls of temperature especially latitude, the distribution of land and water, and ocean currents. Like most other isothermal maps of large regions, all temperatures on these world maps have been reduced to sea level to eliminate the complications caused by differences in altitude. 
On both maps the isotherms generally trend east and west and show a decrease in temperatures poleward from the tropics. They illustrate one of the most fundamental aspects of world temperature distribution, that the effectiveness of incoming solar radiation in heating Earth's surface and the atmosphere above it is largely a function of latitude. Moreover, there is a latitudinal shifting of temperatures caused by the seasonal migration of the sun's vertical rays. To see this, compare the color bands by latitude on the two maps. If latitude were the only control of temperature distribution, our analysis could end here, but this is not the case. The added effect of the differential heating of land and water is clearly reflected on the January and July temperature maps. The warmest and coldest temperatures are found over land note the coldest area, a purple oval in Siberia, and the hottest areas, the deep orange ovals all over land. Consequently, because temperatures do not fluctuate as much over water as over land, the north-south migration of isotherms is greater over the continents than over the oceans. In addition, it is clear that the isotherms in the southern hemisphere, where there is little land and where the oceans predominate, are much more regular than in the northern hemisphere, where they bend sharply northward in July and southward in January over the continents. Isotherms also reveal the presence of ocean currents. Warm currents cause isotherms to be deflected toward the poles, whereas cold currents cause an equatorward bending. The horizontal transport of water poleward warms the overlying air and results in air temperatures that are higher than would otherwise be expected for the latitude. Conversely, Currents moving toward the equator produce cooler than expected air temperatures. Figures 318 and 319 show the seasonal extremes of temperature, and comparing them enables us to see the annual range of temperature from place to place. Comparing the two maps shows that a station near the equator has a very small annual range because it experiences little variation in the length of daylight, and it always has a relatively high sun angle. A station in the middle latitudes, however, experiences wide variations in sun angle and length of daylight and hence large variations in temperature. Therefore, we can state that the annual temperature range increases with an increase in latitude, see box 32. Moreover, land and water also affect seasonal temperature variations, especially outside the tropics. A continental location must endure hotter summers and colder winters than a coastal location. Consequently, outside the tropics the annual range will increase with an increase in continentality. Figure 320, which shows the global distribution of annual temperature ranges, serves to summarize the preceding two paragraphs. By examining this map, it is easy to see the influence of latitude and continentality on this temperature statistic. The tropics clearly experience small annual temperature variations. As expected, the highest values occur in the middle of large land masses in the subpolar latitudes. It is also obvious that annual temperature ranges in the ocean-dominated southern hemisphere are much smaller than in the northern hemisphere with its large continents. Students sometimes ask, Where in the world would I experience the greatest contrast between summer and winter temperatures? Among places for which records exist, it appears as though Yakutsk, a station in the heart of Siberia, is the best candidate. The latitude of Yakutsk is 62 degrees north, just a few degrees south of the Arctic Circle. Moreover, it is far from the influence of water. The January mean at Yakutsk is a frigid minus 43 degrees Celsius, minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas its July mean is a pleasant 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the result is an average annual temperature range of 63 degrees Celsius, 113 degrees Fahrenheit, among the highest ranges anywhere on the globe. Cycles of Air Temperature You know from experience that a rhythmic rise and fall of air temperature occurs almost every day. Your experience is confirmed by thermograph records like the one in Figure 321. A thermograph is an instrument that continuously records temperature. The temperature curve reaches a minimum around sunrise, Figure 322. It then climbs steadily to a maximum between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. The temperature then declines until sunrise the following day. Box 32 Latitude and Temperature Range Latitude, because of its influence on sun angle, is the most important temperature control. Figures 318 and 319 clearly show higher temperatures in tropical locations and lower temperatures in polar regions. The maps also show that higher latitudes experience a greater range of temperatures during the year than do lower latitudes. Notice also that the temperature gradient between the subtropics and the poles is greatest during the winter season. A look at two cities San Antonio, Texas, and Winnipeg, Manitoba illustrates how seasonal differences in sun angle and day length account for these temperature patterns. Figure 3D shows the annual march of temperatures for the two cities, and Figure 3E illustrates the sun angles for the June and December solstices. San Antonio and Winnipeg are a fixed distance apart, approximately 20.5 degrees latitude, so the difference in sun angles between the two cities is the same throughout the year. However, in December, when the sun's rays are least direct, this difference more strongly affects the intensity of solar radiation received at Earth's surface. Therefore, we expect a greater difference in temperatures between the two stations in winter than in summer. Moreover, the seasonal difference in intensity, spreading out of the light beam, at Winnipeg is considerably greater than at San Antonio. This helps to explain the greater annual temperature range at the more northerly station. Table 2-2, Chapter 2, shows that seasonal contrasts in day length also contribute to different temperature patterns at the two cities. Daily Temperature Variations The primary control of the daily cycle of air temperature is as obvious as the cycle itself, it is Earth's daily rotation which causes a location to move into daylight for part of each day and then into darkness. As the sun's angle increases throughout the morning, the intensity of sunlight also rises, reaching a peak at local noon and gradually diminishing in the afternoon. Figure 323 shows the daily variation of incoming solar energy versus outgoing Earth radiation and the resulting temperature curve for a typical middle latitude location at the time of an equinox. During the night the atmosphere and the surface of Earth cool as they radiate away heat that is not replaced by incoming solar energy. The minimum temperature, therefore, occurs about the time of sunrise after which the sun again heats the ground, which in turn heats the air. It is apparent that the time of highest temperature does not generally coincide with the time of maximum radiation. By comparing figures 321 and 323, you can see that the curve for incoming solar energy is symmetrical with respect to noon, but the daily air temperature curves are not. The delay in the occurrence of the maximum until mid to late afternoon is termed the lag of the maximum. Although the intensity of solar radiation drops in the afternoon, it still exceeds outgoing energy from Earth's surface for a period of time. This produces an energy surplus for up to several hours in the afternoon and contributes substantially to the lag of the maximum. In other words, as long as the solar energy gained exceeds the rate of Earth radiation lost, 
the air temperature continues to rise. When the input of solar energy no longer exceeds the rate of energy lost by Earth, the temperature falls. The lag of the daily maximum is also a result of the process by which the atmosphere is heated. Recall that air is a poor absorber of most solar radiation, consequently, it is heated primarily by energy re-radiated from Earth's surface. The rate at which Earth supplies heat to the atmosphere through radiation, conduction and other means, however, is not in balance with the rate at which the atmosphere radiates away heat. Generally, for a few hours after the period of maximum solar radiation, more heat is supplied to the atmosphere by Earth's surface than is emitted by the atmosphere to space. As a result, most locations experience an increase in air temperature during the afternoon. In dry regions, particularly on cloud-free days, the amount of radiation absorbed by the surface will generally be high. Therefore, the time of the maximum temperature at these locales will often occur quite late in the afternoon. Humid locations, in contrast, will frequently experience a shorter time lag in the occurrence of their temperature maximum. Magnitude of Daily Temperature Changes The magnitude of daily temperature changes is variable and may be influenced by locational factors or local weather conditions or both. See Box 3-3. Four common examples illustrate this point. The first two relate to location, and the second two pertain to local weather conditions. 1. Variations in sun angle are relatively great during the day in the middle and low latitudes. However, points near the poles experience a low sun angle all day. Consequently, the temperature change experienced during a day in the high latitudes is small. 2. A windward coast is likely to experience only modest variations in the daily cycle. During a typical 24-hour period the ocean warms less than 1 degree Celsius. As a result, the air above it shows a correspondingly slight change in temperature. For example, Eureka, California, a windward coastal station, consistently has a lower daily temperature range than Des Moines, Iowa, an inland city at about the same latitude. Annually the daily range at Des Moines averages 10.9 degrees Celsius, 19.6 degrees Fahrenheit, compared with 6.1 degrees Celsius, 11 degrees Fahrenheit, at Eureka a difference of 4.8 degrees Celsius, 8.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 3. As mentioned earlier, an overcast day is responsible for a flattened daily temperature curve, see figure 315. By day, clouds block incoming solar radiation and so reduce daytime heating. At night the clouds retard the loss of radiation by the ground and air. Therefore, nighttime temperatures are warmer than they otherwise would have been. 4. The amount of water vapor in the air influences daily temperature range because water vapor is one of the atmosphere's important heat-absorbing gases. When the air is clear and dry, heat readily escapes at night, and the temperature falls rapidly. When the air is humid, Absorption of outgoing long wavelength radiation by water vapor slows nighttime cooling, and the temperature does not fall to as low a value. Thus, dry conditions are associated with a higher daily temperature range because of greater nighttime cooling. Although the rise and fall of daily temperatures usually reflects the general rise and fall of incoming solar radiation, such is not always the case. For example, a glance back at figure 321 shows that on May 23 the maximum temperature occurred at midnight, after which temperatures fell throughout the day. If records for a station are examined for a period of several weeks, apparently random variations are seen. 
Obviously these are not sun controlled. Such irregularities are caused primarily by the passage of atmospheric disturbances, weather systems, that are often accompanied by variable cloudiness and winds that bring air having contrasting temperatures. Under these circumstances, the maximum and minimum temperatures may occur at any time of the day or night. Box 3-3 How Cities Influence Temperature, The Urban Heat Island One of the most apparent human impacts on climate is the modification of the atmospheric environment by the building of cities, Figure 3F. The construction of every factory, road, office building, and house destroys microclimates and creates new ones of great complexity. The most studied and well-documented urban climatic effect is the urban heat island. The term refers to the fact that temperatures within cities are generally higher than in rural areas. The heat island is evident when temperature data such as those that appear in Table 3b are examined. As is typical, the data for Philadelphia show the heat island is most pronounced when minimum temperatures are examined. The magnitude of the temperature differences shown by Table 3b is probably even greater than the figures indicate because temperatures observed at suburban airports are usually higher than those in truly rural environments. Figure 3g, which shows the distribution of average minimum temperatures in the Washington, D.C., metropolitan area for the three-month winter period, December through February, over a five-year span also illustrates a well-developed heat island. The warmest winter temperatures occurred in the heart of the city, whereas the suburbs and surrounding countryside experienced average minimum temperatures that were as much as 3.3 degrees Celsius, 6 degrees Fahrenheit, lower. Remember that these temperatures are averages. On many clear, Calm nights the temperature difference between the city center and the countryside was considerably greater, often 11 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or more. Conversely, on many overcast or windy nights the temperature differential approached zero degrees. One effect of an urban heat island is to influence the biosphere by extending the plant cycle. After examining data for 70 cities in eastern North America, researchers found that the growing cycle in cities was about 15 days longer than in surrounding rural areas. Plants began the growth cycle an average of about 7 days earlier in spring and continued growing an average of 8 days longer in fall. Why are cities warmer than rural areas? The radical change in the surface that results when rural areas are transformed into cities is a significant cause of an urban heat island, figure 3H. First, the tall buildings and the concrete and asphalt of the city absorb and store greater quantities of solar radiation than do the vegetation and soil typical of rural areas. In addition, because the city's surface is impermeable, the runoff of water following a rain is rapid, resulting in a significant reduction in the evaporation rate. Hence, heat that once would have been used to convert liquid water to a gas now goes to increase further the surface temperature. At night, as both the city and countryside cool by radiative losses, the stone-like surface of the city gradually releases the additional heat accumulated during the day keeping the urban air warmer than that of the outlying areas. A portion of the urban temperature rise is also attributable to waste heat from sources such as home heating and air conditioning, power generation, industry, and transportation. In addition, the blanket of pollutants over a city contributes to a heat island by absorbing a portion of the upward-directed long-wave radiation emitted by the surface and remitting some of it back to the ground.
Annual Temperature Variations In most years the months with the highest and lowest mean temperatures do not coincide with the periods of maximum and minimum incoming solar radiation. North of the tropics the greatest intensity of solar radiation occurs at the time of the summer solstice in June, yet the months of July and August are generally the warmest of the year in the northern hemisphere. Conversely, a minimum of solar energy is received in December at the time of the winter solstice, but January and February are usually colder. The fact that the occurrence of annual maximum and minimum radiation does not coincide with the times of temperature maximums and minimums indicates that the amount of solar radiation received is not the only factor determining the temperature at a particular location. Recall from Chapter 2 that places equatorward of about 38 degrees north and 38 degrees south receive more solar radiation than is lost to space and that the opposite is true of more poleward regions. Based on this imbalance between incoming and outgoing radiation, any location in the southern United States, for example, should continue to get warmer late into autumn. But this does not occur because more poleward locations begin experiencing a negative radiation balance shortly after the summer solstice. As the temperature contrasts become greater, the atmosphere and ocean currents work harder to transport heat from lower latitudes poleward. Temperature measurement Thermometers are meters of therms, they measure temperature, figure 324. Thermometers measure temperature either mechanically or electrically. Mechanical thermometers most substances expand when heated and contract when cooled, and many common thermometers operate using this property. More precisely, they rely on the fact that different substances react to temperature changes differently. The liquid in glass thermometer shown in Figure 325 is a simple instrument that provides relatively accurate readings over a wide temperature range. Its design has remained essentially unchanged since it was developed in the late 1600s. When temperature rises, the molecules of fluid grow more active and spread out, the fluid expands. Expansion of the fluid in the bulb is much greater than the expansion of the enclosing glass. As a consequence, a thin thread of fluid is forced up the capillary tube. Conversely, when temperature falls, the liquid contracts, and the thread of fluid moves back down the tube toward the bulb. The movement of the end of this thread, known as the meniscus, is calibrated against an established scale to indicate the temperature. The highest and lowest temperatures that occur each day are of considerable importance and are often obtained by using specially designed liquid in glass thermometers. Mercury is the liquid used in the maximum thermometer, which has a narrowed passage called a constriction in the bore of the glass tube just above the bulb, figure 326A. As the temperature rises, the mercury expands and is forced through the constriction. When the temperature falls, the constriction prevents a return of mercury to the bulb. As a result, the top of the mercury column remains at the highest point, maximum temperature attained during the measurement period. The instrument is reset by shaking or by whirling it to force the mercury through the constriction back into the bulb. Once the thermometer is reset, it indicates the current air temperature. In contrast to a maximum thermometer that contains mercury, a minimum thermometer contains a liquid of low density such as alcohol. Within the alcohol, and resting at the top of the column, is a small dumbbell-shaped index, figure 326b. As the air temperature drops, the column shortens, and the index is pulled toward the bulb by the effect of surface tension with the meniscus. When the temperature subsequently rises, the alcohol flows past the index, leaving it at the lowest temperature reached. 
To return the index to the top of the alcohol column, the thermometer is simply tilted. Because the index is free to move, the minimum thermometer must be mounted horizontally, otherwise, the index will fall to the bottom. Another commonly used mechanical thermometer is the bimetal strip. As the name indicates, this thermometer consists of two thin strips of metal that are bonded together and have widely different expansion properties. When the temperature changes, both metals expand or contract, but they do so unequally, causing the strips to curl. This change corresponds to the change in temperature. The primary meteorological use of the bimetal strip is in the construction of a thermograph, an instrument that continuously records temperature. The changes in the curvature of the strip can be used to move a pen arm that records the temperature on a calibrated chart that is attached to a clock-driven, rotating drum, figure 327. Although very convenient, Thermograph records are generally less accurate than readings obtained from a mercury and glass thermometer. To obtain the most reliable values, it is necessary to check and correct the thermograph periodically by comparing it with an accurate, similarly exposed thermometer. Electrical thermometers some thermometers do not rely on differential expansion but instead measure temperature electrically. A resistor is a small electronic part that resists the flow of electrical current. A thermistor, thermal resistor, is similar, but its resistance to current flow varies with temperature. As temperature increases, so does the resistance of the thermistor, reducing the flow of current. As temperature drops, so does the resistance of the thermistor, allowing more current to flow. The current operates a meter or digital display that is calibrated in degrees of temperature. The thermistor thus is used as a temperature sensor and electrical thermometer. Thermistors are rapid response instruments that quickly register temperature changes. Therefore, they are commonly used in radiosondes where rapid temperature changes are often encountered. The National Weather Service also uses a thermistor system for ground level readings. The sensor is mounted inside a shield made of louvered plastic rings, and a digital readout is placed indoors. Figure 328. Students sometimes ask, What are the highest and lowest temperatures ever recorded at Earth's surface? The world's record high temperature is nearly 58 degrees Celsius, 136 degrees Fahrenheit. It was recorded on September 13, 1922, at Azizia, Libya, in North Africa's Sahara Desert. The lowest recorded temperature is minus 89 degrees Celsius, minus 129 degree F. This incredibly frigid temperature was recorded in Antarctica, at the Russian Vostok Station, on July 21, 1983. Instrument Shelters How accurate are thermometer readings? Accuracy depends not only on the design and quality of the instruments but also on where they are placed. Placing a thermometer in direct sunlight will give a grossly excessive reading because the instrument itself absorbs solar energy much more efficiently than does the air. Placing a thermometer near a heat radiating surface, such as a building or the ground, also yields inaccurate readings. Another way to assure false readings is to prevent air from moving freely around the thermometer. So where should a thermometer be placed to read air temperature accurately? The ideal location is an instrument shelter, figure 329. An instrument shelter is a white box that has louvered sides to permit the free movement of air through it, 
while shielding the instruments from direct sunshine, heat from the ground, and precipitation. Furthermore, the shelter is placed over grass whenever possible and as far away from buildings as circumstances permit. Finally, the shelter must conform to a standardized height so that the thermometers will be mounted at 1.5 meters, 5 feet, above the ground, box 34. Temperature Scales In the United States, TV weather reporters give temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit. But scientists as well as most people outside the United States use degrees Celsius. Scientists sometimes also use the Kelvin, or absolute, scale. What are the differences among these three temperature scales? To make quantitative measurement of temperature possible, it was necessary to establish scales. Such temperature scales are based on the use of reference points, sometimes called fixed points. In 1714, Gabriel Daniel Fahrenheit, a German physicist, devised the Fahrenheit scale. He constructed a mercury and glass thermometer in which the zero point was the lowest temperature he could attain with a mixture of ice, water, and common salt. For his second fixed point he chose human body temperature, which he arbitrarily set at 96 degrees. On this scale, he determined that the melting point of ice, the ice point, was 32 degrees and the boiling point of water, the steam point, was 212 degrees. Because Fahrenheit's original reference points were difficult to reproduce accurately, his scale is now defined by using the ice point and the steam point. As thermometers improved, average human body temperature was later changed to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In 1742, 28 years after Fahrenheit invented his scale, Anders Celsius, a Swedish astronomer, devised a decimal scale on which the melting point of ice was set at 0 degrees and the boiling point of water at 100 degrees. For many years it was called the centigrade scale, but it is now known as the Celsius scale, after its inventor. Because the interval between the melting point of ice and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees on the Celsius scale and 180 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale, a Celsius degree, degree C, is larger than a Fahrenheit degree, degree F, by a factor of 180 by 100, or 1.8. So, to convert from one system to the other, allowance must be made for this difference in the size of the degrees. Also, conversions must be adjusted because the ice point on the Celsius scale is at 0 degrees rather than at 32 degrees. This relationship is shown graphically in Figure 330. The Celsius-Fahrenheit relationship also is shown by the following formulas. The temperature in degree Fahrenheit equals 1.8 times the temperature in degree Celsius plus 32. And, the temperature in degree Celsius equals the temperature in degree Fahrenheit minus 32, all divided by 1.8. You can see that the formulas adjust for degree size with the 1.8 factor and adjust for the different 0 degrees points with the plus minus 32 factor. For some scientific purposes a third temperature scale is used, the Kelvin, or absolute, scale. On this scale, degrees Kelvin are called Kelvins, abbreviated K. This scale is similar to the Celsius scale because its divisions are exactly the same, there are 100 degrees separating the melting point of ice and the boiling point of water. However, on the Kelvin scale, the ice point is set at 273 K, and the steam point is at 373 K, figure 330. The reason is that the zero point represents the temperature at which all molecular motion is presumed to cease, called absolute zero. Thus, 
unlike with the Celsius and Fahrenheit scales, it is not possible to have a negative value when using the Kelvin scale, for there is no temperature lower than absolute zero. The relationship between the Kelvin and Celsius scales is easily written as follows. The temperature in degree Celsius equals the temperature in Kelvin minus 273. And the, the temperature in Kelvin equals the temperature in degree Celsius plus 273. Box 34 Applying temperature data To make weather data more useful to people, many different applications have been developed. This box focuses on three indices that all have the term degree days as part of their name, heating degree days, cooling degree days, and growing degree days. The first two are relative measures that allow us to evaluate the weather produced needs and costs of heating and cooling. The third is a simple index used by farmers to estimate the maturity of crops. Heating degree days Heating degree days represent a practical method for evaluating energy demand and consumption. This index starts from the assumption that heating is not required in a building when the daily mean temperature is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 18.3 degrees Celsius, or higher. Simply, each degree of temperature below 65 degrees Fahrenheit is counted as one heating degree day. Therefore, Heating degree days are determined each day by subtracting the daily mean below 65 degrees Fahrenheit from 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, a day with a mean temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit has 15 heating degree days, 65 minus 50 equals 15, and one with an average temperature of 65 degrees Fahrenheit or higher has none. The amount of heat required to maintain a certain temperature in a building is proportional to the total heating degree days. This linear relationship means that doubling the heating degree days usually doubles the fuel consumption. Consequently, a fuel bill will generally be twice as high for a month with 1000 heating degree days as for a month with 500. When seasonal totals are compared for different places, we can estimate differences in seasonal fuel consumption, Table 3C. For example, more than five times as much fuel is required to heat a building in Chicago, nearly 6,500 total heating degree days, than to heat a similar building in Los Angeles, almost 1,300 heating degree days. This statement is true, however only if we assume that building construction and living habits in these areas are the same. Each day, the previous day's accumulation is reported along with the total thus far in the season. For reporting purposes the heating season is defined as the period from July 1st through June 30. These reports often include a comparison with the total up to this date last year or with the long-term average for this date or both and so it is a relatively simple matter to judge whether the season thus far is above, below, or near normal. Cooling degree days Just as fuel needs for heating can be estimated and compared by using heating degree days, the amount of power required to cool a building can be estimated by using a similar index called the cooling degra a day. Because the 65 degrees Fahrenheit base temperature is also used in calculating this index, cooling degree days are determined each day by subtracting 65 degrees Fahrenheit from the daily mean. Thus, if the mean temperature for a given day is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 cooling degree days would be accumulated. Mean annual totals of cooling degree days for selected cities are shown in Table 3C. By comparing the totals for Baltimore and Miami, we can see that the fuel requirements for cooling a building in Miami are almost two one-half times as great as for a similar building in Baltimore. The cooling season is conventionally measured from January 1 through December 31. Therefore, 
when cooling degree day totals are reported, the number represents the accumulation since January 1 of that year. Although indices that are more sophisticated than heating and cooling degree days have been proposed to take into account the effects of wind speed, solar radiation, and humidity, degree days continue to be widely used. Growing degree days Another practical application of temperature data is used in agriculture to determine the approximate date when crops will be ready for harvest. This simple index is called the growing degree day. The number of growing degree days for a particular crop on any day is the difference between the daily mean temperature and the base temperature of the crop, which is the minimum temperature required for it to grow. For example, the base temperature for sweet corn is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and for peas it is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, on a day when the mean temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, the number of growing degree days for sweet corn is 25 and the number for peas is 35. Starting with the onset of the growth season, the daily growing degree day values are added. Thus, if 2,000 growing degra a days are needed for a crop to mature, it should be ready to harvest when the accumulation reaches 2,000, figure 3i. Although many factors important to plant growth are not included in the index, such as moisture conditions and sunlight, this system nevertheless serves as a simple and widely used tool in determining approximate dates of crop maturity. Students sometimes ask, Which countries use the Fahrenheit scale? The United States and Belize, a small country in Central America, continue to use the Fahrenheit scale for everyday applications. The rest of the world has adopted the Celsius scale. The Celsius and Kelvin scales are used universally in the scientific community. Heat stress and wind chill, indices of human discomfort. Summertime weather reports often try to make people aware of potential harmful effects of high humidity coupled with high temperatures. In winter we are reminded about the effect of strong winds combined with low temperatures. In the first instance, we are cautioned about heat stress and the possibility of heat stroke, and in the second case we are warned about wind chill and the potential dangers of frostbite. These indices are expressions of apparent temperature the temperature that a person perceives. Heat stress and wind chill are based on the fact that our sensation of temperature is often different from the actual air temperature recorded by a thermometer. The human body is a heat generator that continually releases energy. Anything that influences the rate of heat loss from the body also influences our sensation of temperature thereby affecting our feeling of comfort. Several factors control the thermal comfort of the human body, and certainly air temperature is a major one. Other environmental conditions are also significant, such as relative humidity, wind, and sunshine. Heat stress high temperatures plus high humidities High humidity contributes significantly to the discomfort people feel during a heat wave. Why are hot, muggy days so uncomfortable? Humans, like other mammals, are warm-blooded creatures who maintain a constant body temperature, regardless of the temperature of the environment. One of the ways the body prevents overheating is by perspiring. However, this process does little to cool the body unless the perspiration can evaporate. It is the cooling created by the evaporation of perspiration that reduces body temperature. Because high humidities retard evaporation, people are more uncomfortable on a hot and humid day than on a hot and dry day. Generally, temperature and humidity are the most important elements influencing summertime human comfort. One index widely used by the National Weather Service that combines these factors to establish the degree of comfort or discomfort is called the Heat Stress Index, 
or simply the heat index. If you examine figure 331, you will see that as relative humidity increases, the apparent temperature, and thus heat stress, increases as well. Further, when the relative humidity is low, the apparent temperature can have a value that is less than the actual air temperature. It is important to note that factors such as the length of exposure to direct sunlight, the wind speed, and the general health of the individual greatly affect the amount of stress a person will experience. In addition, while a period of hot, humid weather in New Orleans might be reasonably well tolerated by its residents, a similar event in a northern city such as Minneapolis would not be well tolerated. This occurs because hot and humid weather is more taxing on people who live where these conditions are relatively rare than it is on people who live where prolonged periods of heat and high humidity are the rule. Wind chill the cooling power of moving air. Most everyone is familiar with the wintertime cooling power of moving air. When the wind blows on a cold day, we realize that comfort would improve if the wind would stop. A stiff breeze penetrates ordinary clothing and reduces its capacity to retain body heat while causing exposed parts of the body to chill rapidly. Not only is cooling by evaporation heightened in this situation but the wind is also acting to carry heat away from the body by constantly replacing warmer air next to the body with colder air. The U.S. National Weather Service and the Meteorological Services of Canada use a wind chill temperature WCT, index that is designed to calculate how the wind and cold feel on human skin, figure 332. The index accounts for wind effects at face level and takes into account body heat loss estimates. It was tested on human subjects in a chilled wind tunnel. The results of those trials were used to validate and improve the accuracy of the formula. The wind chill chart includes a frostbite indicator that shows where temperature, wind speed, and exposure time will produce frostbite, figure 332. It is worth pointing out that in contrast to a cold and windy day, a calm and sunny day in winter feels warmer than the thermometer reading. In this situation the warm feeling is caused by the absorption of direct solar radiation by the body. The index does not take into account any offsetting effect for wind chill due to solar radiation. Such a factor may be added in the future. It is important to remember that the wind chill temperature is only an estimate of human discomfort. The degree of discomfort felt by different people will vary because it is influenced by many factors. Even if clothing is assumed to be the same, individuals vary widely in their responses because of such factors as age, physical condition, state of health, and level of activity. Nevertheless, as a relative measure, the WCT index is useful because it allows people to make more informed judgments regarding the potential harmful effects of wind and cold. Temperature in Review Temperature is one of the basic elements of weather and climate. Commonly used temperature data include daily mean temperature, daily temperature range, monthly mean temperature, annual mean temperature, and annual temperature range. Such data are commonly depicted on maps using isotherms, lines of equal temperature. The controls of temperature factors that cause temperature to vary from place to place and from time to time include latitude, differential heating of land and water, ocean currents, altitude, geographic position, and cloud cover and albedo. On world maps showing January and July mean temperatures, isotherms generally trend east-west and show a decrease in temperature moving poleward from the equator. When the two maps are compared, a latitudinal shifting of temperatures is easily seen. Bending isotherms reveal the locations of ocean currents. 
Annual temperature range is small near the equator and increases with an increase in latitude. Outside the tropics, annual temperature range also increases as marine influence diminishes. The primary control of the daily cycle of air temperature is Earth's rotation. The magnitude of daily changes is variable and influenced by locational factors, local weather conditions, or both. As a consequence of the mechanism by which Earth's atmosphere is heated, the months of the highest and lowest temperatures do not coincide with the periods of maximum and minimum incoming solar radiation. Thermometers measure temperature either mechanically or electrically. Most mechanical thermometers are based on the ability of a material to expand when heated and contract when cooled. Electrical thermometers use a thermistor, a thermal resistor, to measure temperature. Temperature scales are established using reference points, called fixed points. Three common scales are the Fahrenheit scale, the Celsius scale, and the Kelvin, or absolute, scale. Heat stress and wind chill are two familiar uses of temperature data that relate to apparent temperature the temperature people perceive.